Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. We got to talk about Dark Side of the Ring, uh, Atsushi Onita, and FMW. So, um, because this is from Japan, I had I found a site, which is an FMW historical site. At least I hope it is. <laughs> I didn't use Wikipedia. I just happened to come across this site. So I'm going to use the site to sort of flesh out uh, some of the stories that were mentioned here. And that's going to be the best I can do. Like, I can't do, like, a ton of independent research on this subject. But um, there is a lot of things that they touched on that I kind of wanted to further get into. So um, we're going to do that. But first, let's get into the uh, what the documentary has to say. So we begin with uh, Onita's introduction to wrestling, which it comes from a manga, Giant Typhoon, which is a manga that was based off the career of Giant Baba. And uh, he kind of begins the idea that wrestling is pretty cool, and he decides to get into it. Um, he becomes a huge fan of the funks as they make regular trips to Japan. And um, when he becomes a wrestler, he kind of wants to go during his excursion. He goes to Amarillo. Uh, he idolized Terry Funk and he trusted Terry Funk. And Terry Funk is in the documentary. In fact, I didn't go through the cast. So the cast uh, consists of Mick Foley, Terry Funk, Atsushi Onita, Chris Jericho, Ricky Fuji, Shell, who was the daughter of Shoichi Arai, and Ayane Izaki, who was the daughter of Hayabusa, and as well as Sabu. So, um, Terry Funk's in, basically just told the story of how he, he first met him, that um, Onita had refused to do a job in the Dominican Republic at one point. Um, he got beat up for it, <laughs> and uh, he ended up coming back to Amarillo, and um, that's when he kept, they became friends, and Terry Funk took care of him, bought him a car, helped him get booked around towns, and Onita uh, became a fan of hardcore wrestling in Memphis. Um, he would took place in the Tupelo concession stand brawl where, and, um, he said Memphis kind of liked brawling and he kind of saw how it could get people so excited. Um, after a woman kicked him in the mouth with her heels, he realized that, you know, this stuff really got people amped up, but it wasn't really his style. He was trying to be a stereotypical junior heavyweight from all Japan. And then he goes back to all Japan and he gets hurt. Um, he shattered his kneecap. And there was just no way of him returning to the athletic style that he had before. He was kind of forced into a retirement. Uh, from there, he tried some odd jobs, from my understanding. We'll probably go into it a little bit more when I go through the uh, the history. But um, it, when he started to get back into wrestling, because he cannot perform at the same level he used to, so he changes his style. His style goes from being athletic and high-flying to more spectacles. He starts getting into just nonsense. So he challenges a martial artist named Masashi Aoji to, uh, Aogi, maybe, to, uh, fights. And essentially, there, this organization was called the UWF. It was a sort of shoot style promotion. That's what's been like harder edged than even New Japan was at the time, which is known for its strong style, especially during Enoki's era. Um, he just wanted to create attractions. And he basically just took, beatings from this guy um and found that fans really got off on things like people fighting in the stands and uh you know guys take a tremendous amount of punishment and he realized at this point that something along the lines of fmw or what he had experienced in memphis could actually happen here so in october of 89 he came up with the fmw promotion which stood for frontier martial arts wrestling uh, his philosophy was to always push further that people, if you have one thing, then people are going to get bored. So you have to, that's why he created a hybrid organization. If you think of it in a way of like old school ECW, where you would have sometimes high flyers, sometimes technical wrestling, but it was known for its hardcore base. And like uh, you said, people get bored with, you know, one thing. So you always want to push further. You always want to go farther. And Foley says that, you know, injuries are encouraged and impossible to avoid. And Foley talked about, you know, people engaging in all sorts of self-annihilation, which is wild. <laughs> he says that, you know, he was competing with All Japan and New Japan, both of which was more popular than what he was doing. So you have to do what others won't do. 
And he told the story of Megu- or I think Mick Foley may have told the story of Megumi Kudo, who got set on fire, you know, from um, a fire spitting spot where she basically uh, her clothes and everything got melted and all over her body. And basically, that's the way of them setting setting out, you know, wanting to be different. Ricky Fuji and Chris Jericho have both worked in uh, FMW. Jericho worked there. He said his first match, he got his ass kicked by a martial artist. Uh, Sabu says that he was never properly invited to FMW, and but he ended up um, going up there because of his uncle. But apparently the story goes that uh, the Sheik, or I call it Sheik Farhat, and Abdullah the Butcher were big stars in Japan. And uh, 20 years later, the Sheik is being called back to Japan to do barbed wire matches. And that um, he just decided to tag along. Um, this led to the fire match. Where we'll talk to it. We'll talk about it in a minute. He was asked, of course, whether barbed wire matches are fun or not. And he said the barbed wire sucks because it rips your skin open. It's like, obviously, look at Sabu's skin. Um, are you serious? Um, so Onida becomes one of the biggest stars in Japan. Mick Foley kind of explains this as he wasn't a larger than life superhero, but he connected with people. On the, on the same level of, you know, the amount of punishment he could take and the amount of emotion that he could generate, that it was a different style of connection with the audience that, you know, he says that he was limited physically, but not in will. Basically, people were attracted to his fighting spirit and his will to survive and will to win. And then Foley, of course, explained that, you know, a wrestling match is man versus man. But in FMW, it was always, it was man versus man, but it was also man versus wire, and man versus flame, man versus electricity or whatever the hell, right? So you've got to learn to embrace that stuff. And then Jericho tells the story of uh, Onita after one match getting so emotional that he cried in front of the audience. And that got him, you know, he became like a cult icon because he cried in front of the audience. And this is, of course, a uh, wild thing started to play. Um, then I need to start talking about some of the weirder things that he did, like fights in pools, fights at harbors. And, you know, he just, if he thought about it, he did it. And this brought us to the fire match, 1992. Uh, Sushi Onita and Tarzan go to over to Sabu and the Sheik. Um, apparently, they set the ring on fire. Now, Sabu says that they ripped this match from Puerto Rico and that, as, as per the usual, when it comes to hardcore promotions, they just wanted to top one another. And uh, even Foley said this is too insane for him because he's not in, you are not in control of the danger here. You know, it's the, the, the fire is its own entity. So um, Sabu talked about, you know, it got too hot too fast. He couldn't breathe. He had to get the hell out of there. Tarzan Goto got the hell out of there. And Onita was the one of the last, <laughs> the third guy to escape the ring. And they left behind 62 or 65, depending on who you ask, year old Sheik Farhat. They left him in the ring. He ended up escaping out of the, uh, eventually, but it burned 60% of his body. And it that, it, that sounds absurd. Okay, you left a 62-year, all three of these dudes. Now, I understand you probably panicked. You're dying or whatever. But this dude's 62. And you left him in the ring to get burned alive. And he comes out looking like a hot dog left on the grill too long. What kind of horse? <laughs> Come on, man. 60% of burns all over his body. Sabu was asked if he was mad about it. And he was like, no. The plan was just bad. And that, uh, Onita gave me life. I can't be mad at him. It's ridiculous. Uh, Foley started saying that how Onita started off as an underdog, but eventually he became a king. You know, he started living very lavishly. Onita started talking about how much money he made. So he made about two million a year at his peak, and that his success eventually went to his head. Um, Foley, I mean Funk, rather complained that Onita basically soaked up all the money. <laughs> uh, it was that was horrifying. So they also talked about the yakuza. And that the Yakuza influence in uh, Japanese pro wrestling. And Funk said they control the arenas. Um, it was a it was a little bit kind of like that from what I read. And uh, Jericho said it was pretty much a money laundering scheme that they would, you know, um, try to wash their money through pro wrestling or something like that. Or mixed martial arts was another one he was used to do. And Foley said he used to go to dinner with the sponsors and he would see pieces of the pinkies missing. And why it made him uncomfortable, he said it, they were part of what made this whole thing work. 
I guess because they were the only people willing to put money up to do this. I mean, it's human cockfighting, for Christ's sake. Um, Sabu said they would get their own places in the arena. I do remember this. They would actually buy tickets in bulk. Sometimes they would resell these tickets, but most of the time they would just use them themselves. So they would have like their own little section. And when you go to brawl into the crowd, which is what they did all the time in FMW, you were basically told not to go into the area with the Yakuza because they're not going to play along, right? <laughs> so Sabu apparently went over there anyway after being told not to. And uh, they felt disrespected. So after the show, they decided to put the beats on him. And they did. And Mike Austin ended up saving his life as he was getting his ass beat by Yakuza, which was sounds pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> that sounds wild. So um, Yakuza, not Yakuza, um, Onita decides to have his craziest stunt yet in May of 1993. The exploding ring of death match, which is what AEW tried to replicate. The, the match was a massive success. It drew 41,000 fans and $1.8 million. Um, that he wanted to, Onita says that he idolized Funk. He just wanted to hear from Terry Funk that he was a success. And um, it, it was it was insane. And uh, Funk, of course, didn't know where any of the explosions were going to be. He just wanted to capture the moment. just wanted to be there in the moment. Uh, Onita starts saying, like, hey, if you out there, you feel all these people, 40,000 people or whatever. And you feel that, you know, that energy so you feel like a god. And essentially that was the, <laughs> the really the only thing they had to say about this match. And Jericho <clears throat> kind of explained that um, after the finish, after Onita wins the match, you know, they do the big countdown and uh, Onita goes back into the ring to save Funk, which, you know, is the biggest baby face, you know, thing that you could possibly do is try to protect the guy you just beat up. And, you know, you're looking after his well-being because you know he can't move. And, you know, he's right. That is a great babyface move. And it's it goes to show that he actually did put some thought into the things. It wasn't just random violence for the sake of. That it seemed to have a real purpose to it. Or at least there was drama added to it. It, was, it wasn't just like a horror movie. It was, uh, like, I said, like I said, dramatic. Uh, Funk was not happy about the, about the payoffs. Um, th throughout the episode, he kind of showed his disdain for um, the lack of payoffs, which I'm, and I was just glad to see Terry Funk anyway, because over the last several months, it was kind of like Terry Funk is near death every every damn week. But now he looked pretty healthy in this um, documentary, so I was glad to see him. Um, Onita became a pop culture icon in Japan. He was doing game shows. That's t that's typical of Japan, though. Every time I hear about. Somebody becoming a big star in Japan. They ended up becoming a singer. They started doing game shows and TV shows, stuff like that. Kind of the same as in wrestling. And then he randomly decided to retire um, at the top of his game, kind of. Um, but he stayed around for another year to groom Hayabusa. And I'm a huge fan of Hayabusa. And this is why it made me look up the extra information from here. Because they didn't really go into a lot about Hayabusa, you know. But, um... They talked. They said, you know, talked about Hayabusa. He was he was the next. Uh, he was the sort of the, the next guy up, and Foley described him as being elegant yet extreme, or you know, but he could also do the death the death uh, death match stuff. And uh, Jericho says that he worked with Hayabusa. Hayabusa's daughter was says that she, you know her dad didn't start out with a wrestler's body that he had to work very hard to get in shape and felt like he fit the hardcore style. But Onita disagreed. And said that um, Hayabusa was not the right guy to be doing death matches. And uh, this became a situation where now you, you're leaving the promotion to Hayabusa, who is the top star, but he's not the, the president of the promotion or anything like that. These two will go on to have the exploding cage match, which is absolutely insane. It is some insane stuff. I just, I can't imagine doing that it is ridiculous i actually sat and watched this match a long time ago because i am a big fan of hayabusa i just don't like the hardcore crap um but it, it put um fmw in a weird position now i want to go through when i go through the history part uh this is going to be become very important because shoichi arai takes over and the way is it explained in the documentary is that onita just essentially looked at the ring announcer who was shoichi arai and said, well, you're taking over. You're the boss now. 
Now, go do whatever you want. And this guy, who was, again, a ring announcer, he had no <laughs> he had no experience running a wrestling company, booking it or doing anything. He was left with the company, and he didn't know what to do. So... <laughs> Uh, he was kind of, he was kind of stuck here with this whole thing and, you know, trying to make this, uh, this whole thing work. And, uh, Onita returned uh, like a year later, um, to do a young versus old storyline with Hayabusa. And he said he was working heel. And he talked about how in the urban areas like Tokyo, Hayabusa was the baby face, but in rural areas, uh, he was the baby face and he felt like that created jealousy and, um, this is from where he was, or I wanted to move away from the death matches as well. So this led to Arai, Hayabusa, and all of these guys telling him he had to leave. And, um, he was basically being kicked out of his own promotion. There was, there was some holes there that I decided to plug in because it was very necessary. I was like, how do you get kicked out of your own promotion? So what ended up happening is, Onita owed a bunch of money um, to certain people. So what he did was when he um, stopped wrestling, he essentially killed FMW. So what happened is Shoichi Arai had to borrow money from Onita. He borrowed like $100,000 from Onita to restart FMW, but it was a different FMW. You know, Um, so that's how he was able to get kicked out. Because he didn't own a promotion anymore. He had essentially killed his version of the promotion. And now Arai owns the, uh, the promotion with the same name. But it's a different promotion except he owns it now. And Onita was coming back working for Arai. So when all of this stuff started to happen. And really what took place. I might as well get into some of the history part that I learned from reading the, uh, the page. Onita really hated the sports entertainment aspect that they were going into. Uh, in the documentary, they talked about how they were doing public urinal ang- angles, and they showed it where guys were peeing on each other in the ring. This is a guy named F- Fuyuki. He had came up with this world entertainment wrestling thing, and uh, Onita felt it was very demeaning to the FMW brand. And trust me, it, it, was, it was the shits. Like I learned, like if you think somebody got played with bad booking in the United States, please learn about what they did to Hayabusa in Japan. It was awful. Okay, it was awful. To, to give you just a general idea how awful it was, he had done, he had been beating himself up. This is guy's a luchador. He was trained in Mexico, but he was doing, you know, the high flying stuff and doing death matches. His body was beat to shit. So he decides to wrestle under his real name, E.G. Izaki. And uh, in doing so, he has to give up the title of Hayabusa. He decides to, he's not going to be Hayabusa anymore. Because fans, as, after he actually started getting over, because it was, took him forever to get over because they kept beating him. He started, he had become the Hayabusa brand with high-flying deathmatch stuff. And he felt like he couldn't do it anymore. So for the longevity of his career, he kind of decided he was going to retire the Hayabusa character. So he made a big show of taking the mask off and everything. He took it off on his own. And it was his own idea rather. And he was going to wrestle under his real name. They started shooting angles where he had to become some other character. It was, it was stupid. But ultimately what ended up taking place was. Since he wasn't Hayabusa anymore. They started another Hayabusa. And then they had that guy. In pornos, using dragging the Hayabusa name through the mud by doing porno angles, it is, it was, it was absolute horseshit. I, mean, I didn't see it. I just read about it. It was like, oh my god, this is gonna give me an aneurysm. Like it's, it's so stupid. The stuff they were doing was so stupid, man. It was, it was rough. I see why Onita didn't want to be no part of it. They were doing stuff that was so stupid. It was, it was, it was bad, man. It was real bad. But it was a different version of FMW. That's why Onito was able to get kicked out. In any event, um, they talked about Hayabusa becoming paralyzed. So what ended up happening is, um, he gave up being Hayabusa for like a year, uh, for like 2000, like 99, 2000, he had given up being Hayabusa. 
But in, in simple, simple terms, people wanted Hayabusa, him as Hayabusa. They wanted that style, him high flying, doing all that stuff. And he had changed his style when he took the mask off. He had became a more uh, ground based technical wrestler. And while that worked for him, he was put in a position where you have to do what the fans want. So he took the mask back up. In October 22nd, 2001, Hayabusa breaks his neck on an acai moonsault and ends up being paralyzed. And uh, it, it got real bad from there. It got <clears throat> it got real bad from there, man. I, uh, <clears throat> I don't even want to talk too much more about how horrible it got for him. But um, he didn't die for 15 years. And he learned how to walk again. But his life was never the same. And it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And Sabu says, like, uh, you know, I would have rather died than paralyzed. And I, I can't blame him. You know, this guy, just to give you another, just a little tidbit of it. He, uh, his wife left him after, you know, a couple of years of him being paralyzed. He, it's very stressful. So she took the kids and left, which is the shits, right? And I didn't, I, I couldn't, like, after that, I was in a storm. I was, like, really angry. But he ended up, he died by himself. And, like, I, it, was, it was so horrible. It's the most, it's the most horrible shit. He had, like, a brain hemorrhage in his sleep. And he died alone. Like, that's, that's some horrible shit, man. That's some horrible shit. I, I couldn't. I could not imagine that. You paralyzed. You've been paralyzed for like 15 fucking years, man. And then you finally get some range of motion in your body where you can at least stand up. And then, you know, he was taking some medications that caused him to have a, a, a bleeding in the brain because they was trying to prevent him from having a heart attack. And uh, I think it was blood thinners. I think they said it was. And um, he ended up bleeding from his nose and everything. It was... It's, it sounded absolutely awful. Torturous. And he was in there by himself. That's fucked up. No, there's no two ways about it. That's fucked up. <sighs> anyway, moving back on to this thing. Uh, everybody says, like, okay, look. Without Hayabusa, without Onita, this this place is dead. This, this thing is finished. Um, Arai can't pay anybody. You know, the money never comes. Ar Arai doesn't have any money. So, Shell, who was his daughter in the documentary, tells a story that he was actually taking money from the family and using it to keep FMW afloat. In the extra readings that I did, it says that he was borrowing money from the Yakuza and that uh, he had borrowed money from, like, a bunch of different Yakuza groups and his his checks were not clearing. So, he owed money to the wrestlers. He owed money to the Yakuza, and he had to file bankruptcy. He filed bankruptcy twice. I think he filed bankruptcy once, I think a couple of years before this. In any event, he had to file bankruptcy again. Then he went into hiding because he couldn't, he couldn't afford to pay the wrestlers. He couldn't afford to pay the Yakuza. He got the hell out of there. Um, so he, uh, Sabu says that he talked to uh, Arai the day before he hung himself. Um, and there's another story of Hayabusa, who was, again, paralyzed at the time, was talking to him on the phone and um, told him, like, look, whatever you do, don't do it, you know, and the guy did it anyway. Apparently, he went out into a park in the middle of the night and hung himself with a tie. Um, and it, again, horrible, horrifying. Um, he thought that the insurance money that they, his family was going to get for committing suicide. And you know what? crazy thing is you can't do that in the United States. If you commit suicide, the family doesn't get anything. So in Japan, apparently if you commit suicide, you still get insurance money. And, uh, he thought that was going to be able to cover his debts, but it was not enough. And his family was still paying his debts off years after he was already dead, which is again, fucked up. They kind of said that, uh, shell was like, Hey, they took everything. They took our house. They took a bunch of other stuff from us. And that Onita essentially used my dad. They gave this guy a wrestling promotion. He had no idea how to how to use it. 
you know, left him in debt. And to be quite honest, that was part of the problem. You know, the guy didn't know what he was doing. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and Onita says, like, you know, kind of start smoking a cigarette, kind of nonchalant about it. Like, he doesn't think that Yakuza killed him. And they say, like, oh, you, you don't have to pay. You just tell people you can't pay. I'm like, what the, what the fuck? But then you find out Onita actually owed the Yakuza, too. So he kind of just knew how to work with these guys, right? Anyway, uh, <laughs> Hayabusa is dead. Uh, <laughs> Shira- Arai is dead, but Onita isn't. Um so they talked about the 2015 um, FMW relaunch when Onita comes back to the business. At this point, Hayabusa is still alive. He's um, the executive producer. And then when he dies, essentially that killed this whole ordeal. So at the end, we find out that Onita uh, <laughs> says that he created real hardcore wrestling. And that Foley says that, you know, the, an underdog, undersized wrestler built an t- entire promotion around himself. Based on spectacle and blood and guts and everything. And he made a, an incredible success. Um, Sabu admitted that he, he took a lot of things from FNW to ECW. To be quite honest, Paul Heyman did as well. I did a video on that. And it's like Onita says that, you know, it was only one generation. There were no successors. It was just him. Like, there's only one Hulk Hogan. There's only one Giant Baba. There's only one Atsushi Onita. And uh, that's all true, but let's uh, let's talk about some of the history that I learned, some of the historical notes that I picked up. One of the things you would think they would have talked about in this um, documentary is Onita doing something that was completely and totally ridiculous. Onita decided to shoot an angle in 1990 with Jose Gonzalez, who wrestled in Puerto Rico as Invader Number One. In the angle, he gets stabbed by Jose Gonzalez. This is uh, absolutely uh, hor- horrific because Jose Gonzalez is the asshole who killed Bruiser Brody in 1986 or something like that. He stabbed Bruiser Brody. So then he, he didn't go to prison for it, of course. This means Onita starts to shoot an angle with the guy where he gets stabbed. Now, of course, this this thing absolutely backfires and people are so pissed off at him that he decides to drop the angle. But... I mean, you would think that would have been something they would have brought up in the documentary, right? Why wouldn't you talk to him about this this horseshit angle right here? This guy who who who's working with the dude who killed Bruiser Brody. Oh, come on, man! Another little tidbit that I came across while doing some a little bit of research for FMW is that Leon Spinks, former boxing world heavyweight champion, he won the title in 1978. He actually defeated. Muhammad Ali, and one of the few men to beat Muhammad Ali, and the only man who defeated Muhammad Ali for an actual world title. Um, he wrestled at FMW, and I would think they would have spent some time on this because it was actually, um, well, it's probably minute, and uh, it was minute in the career of Leon Spinks, but for um, something like uh, FMW, it was probably pretty cool. So um, it got it got a piece of an article here from uh, PW Insider that we can actually look into. It's actually some some pretty good historical pieces. So it says the next year in 1991, Onita's popularity continued to grow as he began to appear on national television, variety shows, and became a household name in Japan. Onita's goal shifted from keeping his promotion and his name relevant to him wanting to become bigger than Japan's biggest wrestling star ever, Antonio Inoki. And Onita's plan was to bring in legendary names that everybody knew and beat them on the big stage. FMW, um, Based on the original idea of the promotion being around Onita facing off against fighters with other Mac backgrounds after already having defeated judo bronze medalist in 1988, Grigor Vichev from Russia earlier in the year, Onita's dream was to bring in a boxer and defeat him to show a wrestler can beat a top ranked boxer. Leon Spinks, who had already had shown he was willing to travel to Japan and lose to a wrestler as he had faced off against Antonio Inoki and lost to him in October of 1986 was called and asked if he wanted to begin working for FMW to set up a future big show match against Asushi Onita. Spinks, needing the money, agreed and entered the FMW World Strongest Tag Team Tournament, making his de- debut in October, November 1991. So it's going to give um, a little bit of a background. I'm not going to read all that, but Leon Spinks actually teamed up with The Sheik um, and Sabu and all these guys. 
And uh, it sounds pretty cool, <laughs> you know. So, um, it says, uh, okay, the the Onita versus Spinks match would be the F would be FMW's second biggest show of the year in in 1992, held on May 24th. But for the first time in FMW's history, that they would run an unsuccessful big event. They would announce 7,000 people in the 12,000 seat building, but only 5,000 people actually attend the show. Spinks was just not the draw that FMW was hoping. It did not help that it was the first inside big show, and thus they could not do any explosions like FMW had done for all their other shows that were a success. The match between Onita versus Spinks would be a regular cage match, and the match would be horrible as Onita was not the type of wrestler who could carry Spinks to anything decent for over eight minutes, and they did not have an electric crowd that Spinks versus Goto had at Currican Hall two months earlier. Onita would end up defeating Spinks for the WWA martial arts title, and Spinks were pretty much done as far as a main event wrestler after the disappointing crowd and match. Spinks wanted to continue to work for FMW, though as he the pay was better than anything he was getting at the time, and the money was something that he was in need for. SMW's last-ditch effort to keep Spinks in the main event picture was to ask his brother, Michael Spinks, to work for FMW as a team with his brother, but his but Michael refused. Spinks would only then be brought in for big stadium shows to work mid-card matches against working Kawasaki Stadium and losing to former Olympian Gregor Verichev on May 5th, 1993 in a judo versus boxer match on the show. Spinks' last tour with FMW took place in August of 1993, where he would end up facing off against the likes of Terry Funk, who would defeat Spinks by disqualification on August 26, 1993, and getting a win over a KO win over Sabu on August 28, 1993, in Corican Hall. Spinks' last wrestling match would be September 1, 1993, defeating Sambo Asako and Sapporo before FMW would stop booking him. Many of the FMW wrestlers working with him at the time had expressed concern afterwards while working with him that he was already showing signs of memory loss due to his boxing past and him screwing up five-minute matches. And FMW felt all his value was gone at that point, and there was no other reason to continue flying him back, which would end Spink's two-year career in FMW. So this is pretty cool, and you know it would have been something that I would have think that uh, Vice would have been interested in talking about. Um, why not? I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know, th there's a thing in Japan about these guys really wanting legitimacy. Uh, Inoki was really big on it too, wanting to fight boxers, wanting to fight people with real MMA backgrounds just to prove their style is the best. And these kind of really worked environments and stuff like that. <laughs> but, uh, so this stuff happens a lot, you know, with these, with these boxers and stuff, but I think this was pretty fun. I already went through the Hayabusa stuff. So, okay, let's, um, uh, well, I'll give you some more backstory on Hayabusa in a minute. All right, so it says that uh, Onita owed many people upon his retirement, but he had never intended to pay them back. This was under the FMW Incorporated. So Shoichi Arai borrowed $100,000 from Onita to create a new FMW. From there, he gave him $50,000 because he had to buy the belts, the buses, and other items. Then he gave 50% of the company to Onita's stepfather, just to, you know, let him know he's going to pay him back. So the new FMW had to start from scratch. All the money they made from Onita's retirement match, none of it went to the new promotion. It all went to Onita. So Onita took all the money. And the new promotion had nothing. This is why Arai was always broke. So Arai didn't know anything about running off, didn't know anything about running a wrestling company. He did, he did end up getting a TV deal, I believe, a pay-per-view deal, something like that with Direct TV. Then he brings in TV writers, um, and this is where you get the world entertainment wrestling thing. Um, and the boys got pissed off because they didn't know anything about the business. In 1998, Onita hates the sports entertainment style. And uh, this, of course, he's asked to leave because he's making a big deal out of this entertainment style thing. Uh... So you can see that Onita pretty much set up everybody around him to fail. Um, to, to continue that point, we started talking about Hayabusa. So Hayabusa was actually trained in the FMW pro in the FMW system. He was sent to AAA to learn Lucha Libra. He was actually Onita's favorite younger wrestler, apparently. 
He represented uh, FMW and New Japan Pro Wrestling Super J Cup. He spent about six, 18 months in Mexico. When he came back to Japan, he expected to be the ace of FMW, but kind of got looked over. And, you know, he had asked for a match with Onita to prove himself. And Onita was like, nah, you're not built for death matches. And he kind of did the exploding cage match in order to prove that he could do it. Um, and he was given that position. But but he also lost that match. So Onita, who was going to retire, uh, didn't put the young guy over. Instead, beat the young guy. And then made the young guy be the face of the next promotion, of the promotion. And he had to dig himself out of this hole where, you know, he had to now prove himself. So they started doing this storyline where he would, like, lose all the time. Where he was supposed to be the ace of the promotion, but he always lost. So, of course, it was like you dig a hole, you throw your hero in the hole, and he had to dig himself out of it. He ended up, was able to do it. But he didn't get the grand start that a lot of other people, you know, would think. He got a big match with Onita, got beat, and then the houses fell off because Onita took the money and ran. So now you got nobody to draw because the guy who you leaving at the top of the card got beat. And the fans are looking at him saying, he's not as good as the guy who left. So why are we going to come see this guy? So he has to spend years digging himself out of this hole of dealing with uh, being in Onita's shadow. So in about four years, he ends up burning out. And this is when he decides to drop the uh, Hayabusa character in June of 1999. Um, again, he did it to, long, for, to create longevity in his career. He ends up picking the character back up in July of 2000 in order to give people what they wanted. But... Um, this is this is crazy. You can just look at it like reading like these tidbits. You can see that Onita essentially set up everybody for failure. Um, but Arai, I mean, he was just such he was just such a bad bad owner. He was just, it was just, it was horrible. They had a fake Hayabusa versus Izaki, Eiji Izaki, before he took the, uh, the title back up. They had an exploding an anus exploding death match. Where the winner had to put a firecracker in the loser's ass. It's you tell me that getting voted worst match in the observer because it was a hell in a cell match with no finish versus somebody shoving firecrackers in your ass. Which one is worse? Somebody shoving firecrackers in your ass. And they did that to Hayabusa. They shoved firecrackers in his ass. That's what they did. Come on, man. Come on, man. Like, this guy, like, I was just looking, I was just reading this shit. Like, it's, it's absurd. It is absolutely absurd. And the, the idea for the firecrackers in the ass actually came from Onita himself. It's apparently when, um, when A.G. Izaki, who was Onita, not, who was Hayabusa, when he was training in the dojo, when he graduated from the dojo, they, did this ritual where they would put firecrackers in your ass and light it. And it would, you know, like, you know, pop, you know, and, uh, apparently he had did this to these guys. And then somehow it was brought up again in this storyline. And then they did it. They tied him up to a turnbuckle and put firecrackers in his ass. You would think that dark side of the ring going to talk about something like that. They, they didn't though. And kind of for good reason, you know, <laughs> like, I don't need to know that he did this, but since I read it, God damn it, I'm going to share it. In any event, they, they did Hayabusa really dirty. I mean, his career, I can't, the guy was phenomenal and look what they did to him. Um, it also tells a story uh, in the, in the history that Hayabusa had plenty of chances to leave FMW. Um, this goes to show like the loyalty system in Japan. Like you're really loyalty, loyal to the guys who put you on. Because Jushin Thunder Liger kept trying to bring Hayabusa to New Japan. You know, offering, you know, he went through a spot, jumping through hoops to get this guy on the Super J Cup. And Hayabusa would be like, nope, I'm, you know, I'm FMW. I'm the top guy here. Why would I leave to go be a bit player in New Japan? And it actually ruined his friendship with Jushin Thunder Liger over that, which is, which is wild. You know, like that's wild that he really had such loyalty to this promotion, even though it wasn't the same promotion that uh, he was he trained under. 
You know, because technically speaking, this was a whole new deal once Arai took over. And this is where he, it would have been happening. Well, it would have been in 1996, I believe it was. So I think Arai had already taken over because Onida retired in 95. So he was really loyal to this promotion. He let them put firecrackers in his ass. They did an angle where a guy was wearing a Hayabusa mask and did pornos. It was something that... <laughs> Well, but sometimes loyalty is a weakness. I mean, it really is, man. I would not have put up with this shit. <laughs> I, would not, I would not have put up with this shit, man. The firecrackers in the ass would have been a bridge too far. Anyway, let's talk about Arai. So, uh, December 2000, January 2001, Arai didn't pay the talent because he couldn't. Uh, they had changed pay-per-view deals. They had direct TV, I believe. Um, and it switched from uh, from direct TV to another platform. And so there was less money to go around. Uh, around this, Hayabusa was having surgery because he had beat the hell out of his body. He needed like elbow surgery or something like that. So he wasn't around. So no Hayabusa, no drawing. And they had changed their pay-per-views. So they had to declare bankruptcy. In February 2001, March 2001, the talent was paid. But in April of 2001, the the company was broke again. <laughs> and of course, in October of 2001, Hayabusa breaks his neck. So his top star is paralyzed. He's deeply in debt. He has he owes money to all of these different groups. He decides to file bankruptcy again and then went into hiding. I'm talking about Shoichi Arai here. Uh, he was uh, in hiding for quite a while before he decided to kill himself in Mi Mizumoto Park using his tie. He had written a tell-all book early earlier in the year trying to raise money. He had also suffered from a divorce. And he just felt like the, the insurance money was the only option that he really had. And Onida had also started running his own FMW in May of 2002. So in February, you couldn't pay the, the talent. In May, Onita decides to run opposition, and he's the, the guy that everybody knows anyway. And so, Onita set everybody up for failure, man. And and he's, of course, treated like a hero. <laughs> you know, uh, assuming all this stuff is, is true, and I have no reason to believe that it's not. But uh, that's the story of FMW. You know, the documentary itself was fine. I felt like uh, it it told some stuff. It just basically uh, gives people a cursory glance of what FMW was and what the kind of stuff they were into. They talked about their most famous matches, you know, the fire match and exploding cage and the exploding rain. Talked a little bit about some of the darker days of FMW, but they didn't really get into like the nittiest or the gritty and, you know, how horrible some of this stuff was. Um, but you could tell if you watched this documentary that Onida was pretty nonchalant about everything that, you know, he had this, he got this super ego and to be quite honest, his ego also was triggered again when AEW tried their ring exploding ring thing and failed. And he started saying like he wanted to have his own exploding ring match. He wanted to do it again to show people how it's supposed to be done. So you got this guy who, you know, had this ego you know that's really the, the 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 through line here is onita had an ego even before he was you know had done anything that's what got him beat up in the dominican republic or was it puerto rico it was one of the two and you know he his ego increased a lot when he became successful he had built an entire wrestling promotion around himself with himself as the top star and didn't let anybody become bigger than he did he did and in doing that, he ended up killing, essentially, uh, Hayabusa, Hayabusa's start, even though that was his young boy that he really liked. You know, he felt like, oh, you want to be, you want to take my spot. So let me, let me Jedi mind trick you into doing jobs for me and essentially sending you off the block bad. Then you, you find a patsy and a ride to take over your promotion just to show that nobody else can run it but you. And then you try to, <laughs> you try to run a mutiny against your own promotion and you get booted out and then you say you know what i'm gonna run opposition against my own promotion and it's like come on man <laughs> how could you look at all that stuff and still come across with you thinking i need some kind of good guy you know 
and you know, maybe he didn't do this stuff on purpose. Maybe it sounds like he did, you know, it also sounds like he actually knew more about this whole Yakuza thing than, um, he would ever tell anybody. And rightfully so, I wouldn't expect anybody who was, you know, doing business with the Yakuza to, uh, to, to be too, too vocal about it. But, um, it's a truly sad story, man. Cause, uh, guys died for this promotion, man. They did everything they could to keep the promotion alive, but the promotion was one man, you know, without Onita, it was not going to work. And th- that's was the, the icing on the cake at the end. Where he says like, it's one Hulk Hogan's one giant Baba is one Onita. Wasn't going to work without him. And, you know, he knew that it's just a shame. Nobody else did. All right, so uh, what do you guys think? Like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel, donate to the channel. Thank you guys for your time, man, and uh, I'll talk to you guys later.